You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Leading up to Donald Trump's Tulsa, Oklahoma rally, his campaign claimed over a million people registered to come. What happened? Did he meet those numbers? And what did he have to say? Was the rally a glowing success or an utter failure? Jehovah's Witnesses have been having a rough go of it in Russia. This isn't a new situation. Years ago, when I was a young activist, I addressed the problems going on in Russia. I talked about my feelings on the subject, and it was surprisingly controversial. I felt like banning a religion is a bad thing. Has the situation changed? What's going on in Russia now? But before we take a look at all that, let's listen to some voicemails. Don't forget, if you want to call in and leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hey, Owen, this is Michael from Texas. I, I tried this three times. I, I suck at the whole keeping it short thing. Um, you do good work, or you did good work. I feel kind of left out because you did really crappy research when it came to the origins of my church as a Mormon. Um, and I really wish that you would use a better book than the CES letter because the CES letter is very terribly researched, has a ton of internal contradictions, has a ton of external contradictions. All right. All right. Let's pause. Let's pause here. So the CES letter, he, this person claims is terribly researched. I simply disagree with you on that fact. I have researched the information in the CES letter myself independently and found it to be perfectly in line with reality i i I, you haven't cited anything that tells me that it's wrong you haven't given me any examples or information to show me that anything in the ces letter is incorrect if you can provide that to me just put it in the comments if you want and i will take a look at it in an honest way as honest as possible Uh, let's continue listening to the voicemail i also think that i could recommend a few anti-mormon books that you could that are better researched and actually have worthy points. Okay. Um, the CES letter, as far as I'm concerned, has worthy points. It does. It has worthy points. It has a lot of worthy points. I don't need to go through them right now. I've gone through them on my channel a few times. But the thing about this is I read from the CES letter debunk or whatever, like the church's response or Mormon apologists' response to the CES letter, and nowhere through any of the CES letter response did I find anybody saying this was poorly researched or this is fake or anything like that. They all came at it from a different angle. I'm just not seeing it. I'm just not on the same page with you on that point. Let's continue. Take on that the author can actually take credit for since Ronald decided to copy and paste his entire book So Jeremy Runnels wrote the CES letter. The claim is that he copy and pasted his entire book from something, somebody. Doesn't matter. Does not matter if it was copy and pasted. Exactly. Although copy and paste, I don't think existed at the time. But either way, if it's a legitimate criticism, it shouldn't matter if it was copy and pasted. If it was actually plagiarized, then the book wouldn't exist. He would have had to have listed his sources in there, or he could be sued. So I, I'm 99.9% sure it wasn't plagiarized. I've never heard the claim that it was plagiarized before, but using somebody else's argument is not a bad thing. I use the arguments of all kinds of atheists who came before me. I have read lots of books by Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris and everything, and I use arguments from them all the time. They're pretty common arguments among atheists, and a lot of these arguments are common among ex-Mormons, too. So I have no issue with Jeremy Runnels having borrowed the arguments from other ex-Mormons, or borrowed arguments or questions from other people. Let's continue. And honestly, that can be take on that the author can actually take credit for, since Runnels decided to copy and paste his entire book from Reddit. Okay, the book is 114 pages long. 
I can't imagine that there was a Reddit thread that would have added up to 114 pages. But like I said, borrowing arguments from other people, there's nothing wrong with that. I have no issue with that. I can't even verify if that's what he did. But I'm just putting it out there. Even if he did do that, I would have no issue with it. I got plenty of stuff for you if you want it. Um, I enjoy what you do. Even though I am a faithful member of my church, it does help me to trim the hedges and, and help... Uh, counter the people trying to turn into a controlling religion. I think, honestly, you represent us as a cult, and that's only really true when we're on our mission, when we get off our mission. It's very much so a very free-thinking religion. So the point being made here is it's only a cult when you're on your mission. Once you get out of your mission, there, are the, there aren't those like guardrails around you preventing you from whatever, right? Let me explain how behavior modification works. A long time ago, there was uh, somebody named Pavlov. You probably know this story, uh, but just in case there's somebody listening who doesn't, I'm going to tell the story anyways. Um, Pavlov had a dog, and he was experimenting with operant and classical conditioning. So what he did was he would ring a bell one day and immediately feed the dog after ringing the bell. Next day, ring the bell, feed the dog. Next day, ring the bell, feed the dog. Finally, one day he rang the bell, but didn't feed the dog. And the dog started salivating. It was having a physical response. It was expecting food. Its body and its mind were expecting food for no reason. There was no food around anywhere. It was completely unconnected. So what happens when you're on a mission is... They do that kind of thing. That's what a cult is. That's what they do. Behavior modification through a system of rewards and punishments. In the case of Pavlov and the dog, it was a reward system. So he'd ring the bell and he would give food as, as the reward. And sure enough, he programmed that dog to do something that he wanted the dog to do. That is what cults do. That's how they operate. So it completely makes sense to me that after getting off of a mission where you are in full-blown cult mode for 18 to 24 months, maxing out the scale while you're there, it makes sense that they take those guardrails away because they have programmed you to be who they want you to be now, and they know you're going to stay within the confines of what they want. That being said, I do disagree with you. I think that the cult does have control and behavior modification methods outside of the mission stuff too. They expect you to think like they think. There is a reporting system, report on people who uh, break rules. There's also a, a shunning thing that happens, not as dramatically as with Jehovah's Witnesses, and it may not even be mandated by the leadership, but it exists in the culture and that's what matters. So I politely disagree with you on that point. Let's uh, continue listening here. Um, the culture, however, I completely agree is totally cult-like, and I'm actually trying to kill that off, and I've been having some good success. Okay, you've been trying to kill off the cult-like culture and, and having good success. That's good news. I would love to see the religion leave its cult status, for lack of a better term. But you have to understand, this is a multi-billion dollar organization you have an uphill battle i don't you know what i can't even complain about you trying to reform from within if you want to try to reform from within more power to you i think it's a waste of time because i think it's a complete bullshit belief system i'm sorry um that being said i really appreciate you calling in and talking to me about this i really really do it's it's an extremely interesting discussion to have to summarize, I, I simply disagree with you on the point that the CES letter is invalid or has been copy and pasted or whatever you want to call it. Um, just have disagreements with you on that. If you want to address some of the criticisms that I've had of your voicemail, then feel free to do that in the comments and people can take a look through the comments, see if you leave a message down there. Hey, Owen, this is Lucas from Houston. I've got a pretty simple question. You've done recently videos on the Black Lives Matter movement and the right-wing movement, and I was wondering if you could do an analysis of the mindset behind the police and not just individual departments, but uh, sort of the whole country seems to have this 
a mentality that's sort of tied into the right wing uh, sort of consciousness, I guess. And they kind of have these same arguments that they like to regurgitate. And yeah, I was wondering if you could sort of do maybe a bite model analysis on the us versus them mentality and sort of the justifications that the police have for their actions and uh, for their mindset. Thank you. Yeah, that that is a really interesting point. Um, I don't think that to be a cult, it has to have heavy information control. The group has to basically be discouraging people from getting outside sources of information from the leadership. Like the leadership needs to be dictating this stuff. There has to be heavy use of propaganda from the leadership to the membership and narrative control. Uh, that's that's the idea behind it. And I don't really see that too much from the police, exactly. I'm sure it exists in some departments. But for the most part, I, I can't say that I see it coming from the leadership, at, you know, as a whole in every district. Now, I do see some emotion control. I see some of that. And I see some thought control heavily. And I do see some narrative control, too. And I see behavior control. Those are kind of the four components that you need to have a cult. But generally speaking, I think what you're dealing with with the police isn't as... It's not so much a cult as it is just a, a very destructive influence on people. A very destructively influential group. And people have this, like, really strong us-versus-them mentality among the police, like, to a disturbing degree. It's like they've completely dehumanized the people around them and the people that they're supposed to be in authority over, completely dehumanized them. They're ready to push them over. They're ready to kill them. I, I don't understand how you can get to that point and continue to be a member of society continue to be a member of the society that you are dehumanizing. It's really, really bizarre, and it's really scary. So all that being said, the question was, is Black Lives Matter a cult? That was the question that I answered last week or so sometime recently on my main channel. And the answer ultimately was no for a number of nuanced reasons. Does it have potential to be a cult? Yes, 100%. Does feminism have potential to be a cult? Yes. Do anti-SJWs have a potential to be a cult? Yes. Yes, they do. Definitely. Is Black Lives Matter a cult? No. Is feminism a cult? No. The question that you're posing to me here is, are the police a cult? And I'm going to say no, and the reason, in part, is because... It's a very large, amorphous structure, power structure, and it's different from district to district. It's not unified and not as unified in thought as I feel it needs to be to be considered a cult. So with all that being said, there are cult-like qualities about the police. I don't want to dismiss that or ignore it. They, they are there, uh, and it is something that we need to fix desperately the police should want reform desperately because if they can get reform then all of this goes away if we can get the reform that people are asking for all of these problems go away instantly uh, well not instantly they go they go away pretty quickly we'll say that if we could get rid of the police union or at least reform the hell out of it if we could get cops who actually respect people and don't dehumanize them, our country would be in a very different place than it is right now. Hey, Owen. Uh, this is Tyler from Oregon. I know I sent a message earlier, but I wanted to give, um, I wanted to say it again with a little more content, a little more context. What are your and your, your sister's thoughts on the current administration stripping transgender rights medically and potentially completely legally? I am personally devastated, considering I am transgender myself, and yeah, I, I'm not 
really sure how to feel. But thank you for your time, your consideration. Have a good one. I'm also personally devastated by it. Uh, I'm not sure what the reference was to my sister, because I do have a sister, but I don't talk about her very often. <laughs> She's been involved in some of my social media and stuff a little bit. I have an ex who is trans. I think my response to the whole stripping rights away from anybody, trans, gay, or, or, or black, or anybody at all, is a horrific miscarriage of justice that needs to be rectified at the first possible moment. Right now, that first possible moment is November. We have the opportunity to get the administration, and not the person, not just Donald Trump or whatever. I'm talking get the administration out of power who is pushing for this stuff. We need to get the administration out Who's pushing for it now will joe biden is, is he my guy is he my candidate no he fucking sucks i don't like joe biden but every time a right is taken from us i like joe biden more and more like i i'm <laughs> i was debating whether or not i was going to vote at all up until the moment trump started gassing protesters and taking away people's First Amendment rights. We don't have the right to protest in this country. Peacefully protest. We can't peacefully protest anymore without fear of consequences from the government. That's what this country was founded on. The right to protest. And we don't have that right anymore. We don't have that right. It's extremely disturbing and I, and I, I just don't even know what to do about it. Other than vote him out. Vote out the whole administration. It's not a Donald Trump thing. It's an administration thing. That we need to get that administration out immediately. Hey, Owen, this is Jess out in California. I just have a quick question for you about cults. I'm wondering if you've ever talked about Alcoholics Anonymous, um, if you think it's a cult. Um, I know it's kind of a touchy subject for some people. I know it really helps some people, <clears throat> but I've been told that it's a bit religious. Um, and a bit stalkery and culty, um, and I don't really see the medical benefits um, based on scientific studies, and I'm wondering if you would talk about it. All right, thanks. Catch you later. Bye. Very interesting question. I really appreciate that. Uh, to answer your question, yeah, Alcoholics Anonymous is bad. Um, some people may know, some may not, but I was a drug addict for like a long time, for like a few years. And eventually, I, I did go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and more specifically, I went to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. And I also went to secular meetings, to, or not just meetings, but group therapy, basically, and individual therapy to try to help me get past this addiction. I can tell you unequivocally that secular therapy accomplishes more statistically speaking you can look at the numbers look at the statistics here secular therapy accomplishes a lot more has a better rate of success than alcoholics anonymous does and the reason is partly because alcoholics anonymous is not based on psychology it's based on Jesus. That's it. Like three of the 12 steps are about accepting God and asking God for forgiveness and spreading the word and shit like that. Like, how is that helping me at all? That's not helping. I'll tell you what it's doing in your mind. It's linking your sobriety to Jesus. Now, what happens when your faith is challenged? In your mind, you have no reason to remain sober anymore. Like, you shouldn't be linking that shit to religion. Religion shouldn't even be in, a, in this at all. Shouldn't be involved in this in any way. So Alcoholics Anonymous, extremely toxic. Don't like it. If at all possible, you should go to secular therapy. I ended up going to secular therapy by happenstance. It could have been the case that I went through the NA slash AA meetings 
and and gotten clean that way. It's just Suboxone, the, the, the medicine that I take to basically help my addiction. Alcoholics Anonymous won't accept people who take Suboxone. And I had been taking Suboxone, you know, throughout therapy. So only secular science-based therapy would accept me. Alcoholics Anonymous threw up their hands and said, nope, we don't want anything to do with you. So. Hi, Owen. This is Julie from Indiana. Um, so I recently quit drinking, and my health insurance magically all went through in the same week. Uh, my mother and sister-in-law said, oh, that's great. I've been praying for you. Well, I told my mom, because I recently came out to her as an atheist, hey, don't take the credit away from me. But my sister-in-law is sensitive, so should I just say thank you and leave it at that, or should I try to explain it to her? Thank you. I appreciate the phone call. Um, it largely depends. Generally speaking, um, you're at a crossroads here, okay? So in this situation, you have two choices. What do you want to accomplish out of this? Do you want to accomplish communicating your message without your mother shutting down and, and just closing off her ears and not even listening anymore? Like, do you want her to get the message and understand what you're trying to communicate? Or do you just want to burn it all to the ground, basically, is the question. If you want to try to communicate this in a way that she will understand and accept then you have to do it in a way that's not going to throw her guard up. You have to stay calm, unfortunately, when you discuss it with her, if you want her to actually receive the message that you're trying to give her. Yelling at her would probably make you feel a lot better, <laughs> and that may be where it leads if you're not really careful anyways. But if you want her to receive the message that you're trying to deliver, you, you might have to... Say it in an extremely non-confrontational way, in a way that kind of leads her to the conclusion rather than just dropping the bomb on her. Uh, maybe come up with an analogy to describe the situation that you've found yourself in, get her to agree and understand, and then say, okay, now what if I told you that blah? Try to say it in a really calm way that will lead her to the conclusion rather than dropping the conclusion on her. If you're not sure whether or not you can say it in a calm way or if you worry that it's going to turn into a fight, another option would be to text her or write her a letter or something. And in between each response, tell yourself, agree to yourself, you're going to give it like two minutes. If you're, if you're pissed off by what she's saying, by her responses to you and everything, agree with yourself that you're going to wait two minutes to calm down before responding. If you say everything in an extremely calm way and, and, and you're calm when you say it and you think it through, then you will most likely have better results. Gaming studios, would you call Lutherans a cult-like organization? I don't have much experience with Lutherans. My grandmother is a Lutheran. But what, from what I have seen of her church, her church does not really operate as a cult. That may be different for different groups for different Lutheran churches or groups or whatever. So I can't say for sure if they're a cult-like organization. In my experience, no, but that doesn't mean that all Lutheran churches are not cults. Life in the Doghouse. I made a Pavlov joke at work last week and my manager didn't get it, so I had to explain. I think I just assumed that was common knowledge, lol. Yeah, um, it probably is common knowledge, but you know, my videos get between a thousand views and my most viewed video has almost a million so even if a tenth of one percent of my viewers don't know who Pavlov is out of like a million people watching it that's a thousand it's a thousand people so I explain everything even if it's obvious to pretty much everybody I just want to make sure we're all on the same page I don't want to leave anyone out Leah Bryant, this is a shameless plug for my subreddit, r slash anti-NIFB. Yeah, that seems like a pretty interesting subreddit. Uh, it's going to take time to grow, but it seems pretty cool. I need to cover the, the NIFB again soon. That, that's an extremely uh, crazy cult. Oh my god, Owen, you addicted to Oxy too? I had to leave Arizona to best that shit. Yeah, uh, I was addicted to Oxy for a short time. Then I switched to heroin after Oxycontin was outlawed basically. And then I switched to Suboxone. And I've been on Suboxone for like a long, long time now. Long before 
I started my YouTube channel. I just celebrated my third birthday and turned 28. I left J-Dog at 25. J-Dog, is that Jesus? That's a good name for Jesus. It's the first year the family celebrated with me. Happiest year of my life. That's fucking awesome. Third birthday and turned 28. That's the shit. I love it. And it's even better that your family celebrated it with you. That's fantastic news. Basically, everybody in my family's outside the religion now, Jehovah's Witnesses, except for my mom. And... I could celebrate my birthday with them. I could celebrate their birthday with them. But we just don't really have much of a relationship because I was the second person out of the religion. So they all spent years shunning me before they left too. So I'm just used to not really having them in my life um, since they shunned me. And so it's just whatever. Uh, really, really sad. Really disappointing. But it is what it is. I'm glad that you got to celebrate your third birthday, though. I, I think I'm up to birthday number 12, actually. I, I don't celebrate it every year. And I didn't actually start kind of celebrating it until I was like 22 or 23, because I wasn't even an atheist until then. I still believed it till then. But that's really fantastic news that you made your way out and that you get to celebrate it and everything. Really, really good to hear. Next, we're going to talk about what Donald Trump had to say at his Tulsa rally. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The first article I want to take a look at is on Reuters. The title is Trump slams protests and defends pandemic response as Tulsa crowd underwhelms. So this is about the Trump rally. If you were unaware of what's going on right now or if you're from the future, if you took a time machine back to 2020 and you're sitting here wondering what's happening at this point in history... Let me just give you a little uh, little primer on it. Basically, we're dealing with the pandemic. The U.S. went into lockdown mid-March or... Yeah, it was mid-March when we went into lockdown. So that's April, May, June, three months into the lockdown, and Trump is ready to basically release the lockdown now. He's ready for everyone to go back to work. And the real reason that he's interested in that is because he doesn't want the economy to crash even harder than it is before his election, it seems to me. That's the message I'm getting from this whole situation. So what he's doing is he's completely pretending that, you know, the pandemic is over. He, he's even asked people, or he even told his administration to stop testing, slow down on the tests, because that means fewer cases. No, no, that's not what that means, actually. That, it doesn't mean fewer cases. It means fewer known cases. So that's where we sit as of this moment. Uh, now let's give this article a read and see what it says. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Reuters. President Donald Trump addressing a less than full arena for his first political rally in months blasted anti-racism protests and defended his handling of the coronavirus on Saturday in a bid to reinvigorate his re-election campaign. The president, who revels in large crowds and had predicted that his first rally in months would be epic, blamed the media for discouraging attendees and cited bad behavior by demonstrators outside, but did not specifically acknowledge that many seats in the 19,000-seat BOK Center arena were empty. Yeah, we got an update to this. I think the fire marshal said there were 6,200 people there, which is hilarious because he was actually expecting, uh, I think his campaign said he was expecting like a million like a million people reserved a seat or whatever they didn't actually pay but they put in for the reservation they said they were coming but interestingly enough the city itself of tulsa oklahoma only has like three hundred thousand people in it or something like that so there's absolutely no way that would have been completely absurd if like millions of people showed up. But Trump was so confident that this is gonna be a huge event 
that he even set up like an overflow area so that he could go out there after the rally and talk to another crowd afterward. His campaign's not doing very well at this immediate moment. It really needed like a shot in the arm, basically, to help it. And a giant rally would have been the perfect thing. But yeah, he failed miserably. So the question is, where did all of those fake registrations come from? Apparently, there were some TikTok videos that were really, really highly viewed, like lots and lots of views on them, basically having TikTokers go and reserve seats. Like all of the fans were reserving seats and and never planned to show up. So people were actually camping outside for only 6,000 people. And they packed them all in this little tiny area. Like, they could have socially distanced. They could have done social distancing and been safe about the rally since there are only 6,000. And it holds 19,000 people. But no, no, didn't want to do that. Wanted to pack them all in as tight as he could. Take a whole bunch of good pictures of people packed in super tight. It's absurd. It's really absurd. Anyway, let's continue reading. Trump sought to use the event to bring momentum back to his campaign after coming under fire for his response to the coronavirus and to the death of George Floyd, a black man who died in custody of Minneapolis police. The smaller-than-expected crowd robbed him, at least for now, of the ability to highlight enthusiasm for his candidacy as an advantage over his expected Democratic challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden, who has eschewed large campaign events. Trump has brushed aside criticism for his decision to hold his first rally since March 2nd in Tulsa, the site of the country's bloodiest outbreaks of racist violence against black Americans some 100 years ago. Yeah, that's another thing. Uh, Trump decided to hold his rally in a city that was just the, the, the ugliest things happened there to the black community. Segregation was in full effect at this point in history, right? Like a hundred years ago. Segregation was going on back then. I think it was in like the 20s. So this little section of Tulsa, Oklahoma was completely black. It was segregated and, and black only basically. And this was like their financial district. This was their like their banks and their things like that. They called it Black Wall Street because that's where all the money stuff was being exchanged basically for the black community in Tulsa and people actually took like private planes and dropped bombs on it It was like a massive massacre it was a horrific situation that unfolded there a hundred years ago absolutely horrific and Trump decided to hold his rally there in Tulsa on the anniversary of the abolishment of slavery Seems like a dog whistle to me. Uh, You know, I don't know. I mean, Trump even admitted that he knew about the connection and he decided to change it because there was too much pushback. Those were basically Trump's words. So he changed it to the 20th instead of the 19th, which is the holiday when slavery was abolished. So let's continue reading this. The president, who has encouraged a militaristic response to the nationwide demonstrations while being accused of showing a lack of empathy for the plight of black Americans, used his speech to take aim at some of the protesters. Of course he did. Big surprise. The unhinged left-wing mob is trying to vandalize our history, desecrate our monuments, our beautiful monuments, tear down our statues, and punish, cancel, and persecute anyone who does not conform to their demands for absolute and total control. We're not conforming, Trump told cheering supporters. Ahead of the November 3rd election, the Republican president is trailing in opinion polls to Biden, who has hammered Trump for his response to the protests in the pandemic. What doesn't make sense to me about this situation is the fact that what happened to George Floyd was not directly connected to Trump. Like, in the minds of the protesters, Trump was not the cop. He wasn't the one who did it. Now, you can talk about policies that Trump pushed through or that Trump erased from the Obama era that led to this situation unfolding the way it did, but Trump was not the direct enemy of this situation. The protesters were not mad at Trump at first. There are so many things that Trump could have done 
to get the protesters on his side and boost his numbers. There's so much he could have done to get them to like him more. I don't remember who I heard this from. I... I think I may have heard it from, I don't, I have no idea who I heard it from. I'm not going to do a call out anyways, but somebody, this is not my original thought. Somebody suggested, what if Trump, like immediately after this stuff happened, like immediately after the Floyd situation unfolded and these riots were, were playing out, what if Trump had come out to the Rose Garden and just knelt on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds? in solidarity and then went right back inside he may not have had to do anything other than that to just make his poll numbers soar ultimately his response to the protests and everything that happened made people hate him worse why did he make himself the enemy of the protesters he didn't have to do that he was not the target of the protests at first i don't understand Why did he make that stupid decision to make himself the target? It was 100% him. Let's continue reading here. Trump defended his response to COVID-19, saying more testing had led to identifying more cases, seemingly to his chagrin. When you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more cases, he said. So I said to my people, slow down the testing, please. A White House official said he was obviously kidding with that remark. Hours before the rally, Trump's campaign announced six members of its advance team had tested positive for COVID-19. Only a handful of attendees wore masks inside the arena. Yeah, I wonder how many actually did wear masks. I would love to count the people because Trump actually said he felt like people were wearing masks out of revenge or to make him look bad, I guess. I can't imagine walking into this den with a mask on and sitting there listening to Trump. There's absolutely no way I would have the balls to do that. I don't even care. Like, yeah, if I was a journalist, I might, but I would be afraid that somebody would actually use violence against me at this place. I mean, Trump has explicitly endorsed violence, so it really would not surprise me at all. Uh, Let's continue reading here. Mostly a hoax. Oklahoma has reported a surge in new coronavirus cases in recent days, and the state's Department of Health warned that attendees face an increased risk of catching the virus. I'm not concerned about it. I think it's mostly a hoax, attendee Will Williams, 46, said of the coronavirus, questioning why Democrats were not more concerned about people who die from drug overdoses. Williams did not wear a mask. I think that People are a little bit more concerned about this rather than people who die from drug overdoses, which, you know, people are concerned about that, too. But I think this is a little bit more pressing because it it's contagious, extremely contagious. And drug addiction isn't contagious in the same way. I mean, I, I'm speaking as a former addict. So this is just insane. This whole thing is insane. Something else I want to make note of, uh, you may have noticed I said former addict rather than recovering addict. That's because I've been clean for years now. And saying that you are a recovering addict forever, perpetually, in perpetuity, that is an AA thing. Secular therapy says nothing about you constantly being in recovery for the rest of your life. Alcoholics Anonymous makes you put this in the back of your mind until the day you die. And I just don't buy it. I'm not a recovering addict. I am a recovered addict. I am no longer addicted to drugs, like mentally addicted to drugs. I mean, there are medications that, I'm de- that I have a dependency on, like Suboxone. I have a physical dependency. But addiction and dependency are not the same thing. I'm not an addict. I have a physical dependence on some medications, on one medication. I only take Suboxone. Anyway. Sorry for derailing there. Let's continue reading. The president unusually suggested that his own speech to the partially empty arena was not his best. So far tonight, I'm average, Trump said. While Trump campaign officials said prior to the event that demand far outstripped the capacity of the venue, Trump and Vice President Mike Pence canceled speeches to an expected overflow crowd after a few dozen supporters showed up to a space prepared for thousands. Trump campaign spokesman Tim... 
Murtaugh said protesters had interfered with supporters trying to enter the rally. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a million people showed up and only 6,000 managed to, you know, get through the protesters. That totally makes sense. That's actually a little more concerning for your sake, Donald, because if the protest is so big that it can prevent millions or at least a million people from getting through, there's a bigger issue with your campaign. Let's continue reading. There were some shouting matches and scuffles outside the event between around 30 Black Lives Matter demonstrators and some Trump supporters waiting to enter. A Reuters reporter saw no sign any Trump supporters were prevented from entering the arena or overflow area. Trump warned that unless he was re-elected, all Americans would endure the chaos you're seeing in our Democratic-run cities. When you see those lunatics all over the streets, it's damn nice to have arms, he said, vowing to protect Americans' rights to bear arms. Our people are not nearly as violent, but if they ever were, it would be a terrible, terrible day for the other side. See, this is, this is one of the biggest issues with Trump, this us-versus-them mentality, the other side. He doesn't want to unite Americans. He doesn't want us to feel like one country. He wants us to feel like insiders and outsiders. That's one of the hallmarks of a cult and a cult-like mindset is making people feel like they're exalted, they're special. They're better than the others that they're fighting. They're better than their enemies. And you got to give them an enemy to fight. That's how a cult operates, just like that. And Trump's doing it. Tulsa police reported one arrest of a woman wearing a t-shirt reading, I can't breathe, after she refused to leave a private event area. Okay, you know, if it's a private event area, then she has no right to be there if her invitation has been revoked. So I understand if she was moved to another area, that's okay with me. Overwhelmingly, these encounters have been peaceful with everyone attempting to share their views, Tulsa police wrote on Twitter. A small group of armed civilian men were outside the arena during the rally. One of them told reporters they were there in case Antifa protesters turned violent. Wow, dude. That's disturbing. It's a show of force. That, that's really, really disturbing that they were even there like that. After intense criticism, Trump postponed the rally by a day so that it did not coincide with the anniversary of the June 19th commemoration of the end of slavery in the United States. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to do. This this country is a mess right now, and I have no idea how to go about fixing it. I don't know. I don't know. The best thing that I can do is take it one step at a time, one day at a time. Uh, in my eyes, I I hate Biden. I, I could not stand the dude. He's awful, and he's not going to do anything that I want him to do. But Trump released the military on civilians, U.S. citizens, and used tear gas on peaceful protesters. That is far past my line, and I am ready to vote for pretty much anybody to get him out. Pretty much anybody at this point. Uh, let me just read the Super Chats real quick, catch up on these bad boys. This is from Zolfner. Honestly, I never made the choice to quit. Just a happy accident I did when I moved. I didn't know dealers in L.A., but I don't remember like a couple of years. Yeah, a couple of years is how long I spent on it, too. Not good. Shit will ruin your fucking life. It's an epidemic. It's given me a lot of new perspectives on reform. And I, it also encouraged me to go to school for substance abuse counseling, a psychology degree. So that that's proved very useful, very helpful to me. I'm glad you got off of it, though. Shit is really bad for you. Life in the doghouse. Would you say America is a dystopia? We tick a lot of the boxes. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact definition of dystopia. I don't know, like, the, the, I don't know the checklist. I should probably take a closer look at it or whatever, but yeah, I would, I would say it's a dystopia. Yes, for sure. I would say so. Zolfner, I got too involved in the chat to remind you that I hate you. I love guns. I'm not voting Biden. Okay. It's okay with me. Uh, I am. I am voting Biden. I, I'm not going to like it. I'm going to hold my nose. I'm going to vomit in my mouth a little bit, but I'm going to do it. And honestly, at this point, I'm not even going to have to hold my nose right now. But I, I'm becoming an enthusiastic Biden supporter the more shit Trump does. 
I hated Biden three months ago. That was before Trump gassed protesters and unleashed the military on U.S. citizens. Uh, Lucifer Lafleur, you have cats. Do you have a dog? My dog's name is Doge. I love that name. No, no dogs. Only cat. Two cats. One cat is my my girlfriend's cat, Miki. And my cat is named Cashmere, but I think he looks like a Tom. He's a Siamese cat. Revealed owns a flat earther. Anyways, here's my tithe. V2 did nothing wrong. Yes, it did. You're a liar. And no, I'm not a, <laughs> no, I'm not a flat earther. Most definitely not. Thank you, Evan. I appreciate that. When we come back, we're going to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses and freedom of religion in Russia. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Next article I wanted to take a look at is called Jehovah's Witness Gets Six Plus Years in Jail for What Shouldn't Ever Be a Crime. This is by Terry Firma on The Friendly Atheist. Let's read this article and see what it says here. Russia continues to lay trumped up charges against Jehovah's Witnesses and jailing some as an apparent warning to others. I have no love for that faith or any other, but this is dark, disturbing stuff. Here's a quote. A court in Peskov in northern European Russia handed 61-year-old... Gennady Shpakovsky, the longest jail sentence given to a Jehovah's Witness after the 2017 Supreme Court ban on Jehovah's Witness activity. Six and a half years imprisonment in a general regime labor camp, correctional colony, quote unquote. This is the second longest jail term yet handed down on extremism related charges from meeting with others to pray and study beliefs. That is extremely disturbing. So here's the controversy. This is this is a really big deal in the ex-Jehovah's Witness community. Do you believe in freedom of religion or no? Do you think that Jehovah's Witnesses should be allowed to practice their religion or no? A few years ago, it was a really big controversial thing. I came out in support of Jehovah's Witnesses who wanted to practice their religion. I got attacked by a lot of people for that stance. Lloyd Evans held that position too. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right, and the ends does do not justify the means. Cults believe the ends justify the means. That's one of the hallmarks of a cult. They believe that the ends justify the means. We can't be like that. We have to be better than that. If we want to fight extremism, we can't turn into extremists ourselves. So anyways, that that was an extremely controversial position that I held a while back, that I don't think that Jehovah's Witnesses should be jailed for practicing their beliefs. Let's continue reading this and see what it says. Well, I guess that formally, Spakovsky did more than gather with others to pray and study. The man was found to possess two small jars of donations to the church. According to his lawyer... Early Chimarov, they contained the equivalent of about $6. The prosecutors considered that evidence of conspiracy and financing. The allegation was supported by the FSB, the Federal Security Service, the successor to the KGB. Oh, wow. I assume that's like the FBI, basically. Its agents claimed that the Jehovah's Witnesses are building a world theocratic state. That's fascinating. Um, and partially true, I guess. You could say that's probably partially true, but uh, I think that they're worried over a hill of bananas. Let's continue reading. One jar of pocket change at a time, apparently. In April 2017, the Jehovah's Witnesses were banned by Russia's Supreme Court with the justices ruling that the Watchtower tribe promotes extremism. Citizens found to belong to the organization face six to ten years in jail. Thankfully, not everyone turns a blind eye, and moral support is offered from one or two high places. Last month, this is a quote, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention adopted a wide-ranging opinion condemning the raids, arrests, detention, and trials of 18 Jehovah's Witnesses, stating 
It wishes to emphasize that none of them should have been arrested and held in pretrial detention, and no trial of any of them should take or should have taken place. Beyond those 18, there are dozens more Jehovah's Witness adherents awaiting trial in Russia. Human Rights Watch reported in January that at least 313 people are facing charges, are on trial, or have been convicted of criminal extremism, quote-unquote, for engaging in Jehovah's Witnesses' activities or suspects in such cases. About two-thirds of them found out about their status as suspect or accused in 2019. Authorities have carried out at least 780 house raids since 2017 in more than 70 towns and cities across Russia, more than half of them in 2019. Courts convicted 18 people in 2019, nine of whom received prison sentences ranging from two to six years for such activities as leading or participating in prayer meetings. You're bordering on thought crime here. The only reason that this isn't considered a thought crime is technically Russia says you're allowed to think it, but the moment you show any outward sign that you think it, you're going to be imprisoned for it. You just cannot justify this as far as I'm concerned. You, the ends cannot justify the means. You can't do any, whatever it takes to win this battle. You have to respect people's human rights in the process. I said this in the last podcast, I think, or I said this recently in case people didn't hear this. Back in the 80s and the 90s, when you were dealing with cult deprogrammers, it was a different world. Cult deprogramming used to be something very different. It used to be you would hire these deprogrammers to basically kidnap a cult member, bring them to a cabin in the woods and tie them up, not let them leave, and you'd sit there and deprogram them by force. It had a really high success rate, but you were violating their human rights to do it. It's not ethical. It's wrong. We can't resort to cult tactics to solve cult problems. We can't do it. It's wrong. Russia is violating human rights by doing this. I cannot accept this. People have the right to gather, to assemble peacefully, and talk about their feelings and their beliefs. The moment you ban that is the moment you start taking human rights away. Things that should be given when you're born. Let's continue reading this. This is Terry Firma speaking. I can't say I get it. If individual Jehovah's Witnesses are guilty of actual crimes and misdemeanors, child molestation, fraud, sedition, refusal to serve, what have you, then why not prosecute and punish them under the same laws that apply to everyone else? By the way, Russia's population is 144 million. Oh, I, that's an interesting number, like 144,000. Before the 2017 ban, the country had about 175,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. That's just over 0.12% of the total populace. As a result of the state's crackdown, that number must have decreased, in part because some Jehovah's Witnesses have fled the country. Can a handful of people meeting peacefully to read their insane holy texts really undermine a state as mighty as Vladimir Putin's. There's something else to make note of here. Jehovah's Witnesses have been banned in China for like a long time. Like all religions been banned in China for a long time, not just extremist ones. And Jehovah's Witnesses have found ways of operating within the state without basically getting caught and, ar and, and arrested and s sentenced to jail. They do from time to time, but... Jehovah's Witnesses do s still send missionaries to China, even though it's banned there. They still do. I feel like if Jehovah's Witnesses were just blending into society seamlessly and not passing around donations and stuff like that, like, don't pass around any donations, don't meet publicly, just get on an encrypted chat, and, like, on some app, like Telegram, I think, is end-to-end -end encryption or something. Get on there in a little group and hold your meetings through that. Problem solved. Instead, the Jehovah's Witnesses seem to want to, like, make a big deal out of it, and it, it does feed their persecution complex heavily. 
Like, they're obsessed with being persecuted. They want to be persecuted. It's almost weird. It is weird. It's straight up strange. But they could do this in such a way that wouldn't lead to persecution. So I, I'm really not sure why they're doing it the ass backwards way. Either way, Russia's doing the wrong thing, bottom line. I agree with Terry Fermi here. They're doing the wrong thing, completely. Let's continue reading. This is what Terry Firma says. I can maybe see cracking down on open proselytizing, though I'm pleased that would never fly in the U.S., where we're all protected by the First Amendment, but wholesale repression of the sort the Russian state has been pursuing for the last three years sure looks like an awful, completely condemnable human rights violation to me. 100% agree with you on that, Terry. As I noted two years ago, other countries... Where Jehovah's Witnesses have been banned include Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and China. Collectively, a rogues gallery of illiberalism and oppression. Yep. I think Yemen may be one of them also. One bright point is that convicted Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia have some legal recourse, at least in scattered cases. In March, a court in Penza, about 340 miles southeast of Moscow, overturned the verdicts against six Jehovah's Witnesses who'd been jailed on charges of extremism. This is a complicated situation. Does it work? Yeah, you're going to get Jehovah's Witnesses out of Russia. It works. You're not going to get them out of the world. They're going to continue existing. And the moment you allow them back into the country, they're going to come. But you will eradicate Jehovah's Witnesses from the country basically completely. It's the wrong thing to do. You are violating human rights by doing this. I cannot harp on this enough. And I, I hate to see anybody's human rights violated. Terry Firma here said... I can maybe see cracking down on open proselytizing, though I'm pleased that it would never fly in the U.S., where we're all protected by the First Amendment. I don't really feel like we're protected by the First Amendment anymore. Um, on paper, we are. But in practice, not really. Not, not anymore. With the police situation going on in the U.S. at this moment, we're really not. We, don't, we really don't have a First Amendment right at this immediate moment. Um, that may just be because of the president, but he's putting an awful lot of his judges loyal to him specifically in power right now. So constitutionally, we have that protection. In practice, we do not. Let's take a quick look at the uh, Super Chats real fast. Hang on. What the fuck is voice two? <laughs> okay, so voice two is um, a voice chat in my Discord. And... Um, I have like special events voice chat where I do the podcast. I'm in special events voice chat right now in Discord so that people can hear it live. And then there's voice too. When I go away for a minute, like when I go to use the bathroom or whatever in the pre-show, when I'm talking to my Discord before I actually go live on YouTube, people used to go to the voice two channel to talk because they can't talk to each other in the special events channel. Everybody is muted by default. So I said, don't go to voice two or you hate me or something like that and I went to the bathroom and everybody was in voice to chat when I got back so now they're telling me they didn't do anything wrong they did they did something wrong they left the special events channel against my will and it was fucked up Lorenz 42 what are other models besides the bite model that can determine if something's a cult or not there is really one model that's basically been through the scientific process and it's called the ICSA model ICSA and it, it stands for the International Cultic Studies Association they changed their name from something else in in like the 2000s I think anyways the ICSA model focuses heavily on religious cults and doesn't really talk about there doesn't leave room for political cults or cults of personality or, or the cult-like mindset, for example. And that's why I use the BITE model. All of the points on the BITE model have been scientifically reviewed and can be connected to citations, but the model itself has not gone through the uh, scientific vetting process. So it's not used in courtrooms. When we're dealing with cults in court cases, we're, we're going to be using the ICSA model. But that's why I use the BITE model, because I don't always deal with religious cults. Sometimes I work with political cults, too. It's basically the same information. It's just organized a little bit differently. I'm Mexican and African-American. I'm not attacked. No, you... 
personally are not attacked, but I was saying this recently. You personally may not be attacked, and I'm white. I personally don't attack anybody. We aren't talking about who is to blame here. When we talk about white privilege or statistics showing that you know, African Americans are disadvantaged or women are disadvantaged or whatever else, people get defensive about it. They feel like they're being attacked. I am not personally to blame for the problems in America that African Americans are dealing with. I'm not personally to blame for that stuff. White privilege does not mean that I'm to blame. It doesn't even mean that Donald Trump is to blame. What it means is we can look at statistics and see there's a disparity there. So this is 2020 right now, right? In 1955, the U.S. was desegregated uh, on paper, not, not necessarily yet in practice. In 1955, so what is that, 75 years ago? And then in the mid-60s, the Civil Rights Amendment was pushed out, and there was a, a whole movement behind it, and desegregation really took off, and the government started enforcing desegregation, right? So up to that point, African Americans were horrifically mistreated and weren't even allowed to drink from the same water fountains. Yale and Harvard and Princeton, the best colleges in the country, didn't have any African-American students. And if they did, it would be like one. It was nowhere near as many white students as they had. So naturally, African-Americans are going to make less money than white college graduates because they were incapable of going to these nicer schools. So let's take a statistic and just say hypothetically, how much is an African-American person expected to make with a college degree, say a four-year degree, versus how much on average a white student makes with a four-year degree? There's a disparity there. There was especially a disparity in the 1960s, right? And that's not anybody's fault necessarily. I mean, at the time, the government had opened it up so that everybody could attend whatever. Not necessarily my parents' fault or your parents' fault or anybody else's fault. There, there is a disparity there, though. So now let's talk about how to solve that disparity. I don't know what the number is. Uh, I'm just going to make up a number. Say a black college graduate, four-year degree, is expected to make $40,000 a year right out of college. And a white student with a four-year degree is expected to make 60000 right out of college. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing these figures out there. There are reasons for this. It's because segregation really was not that long ago, for one thing. It was our parents' generation who ended segregation. And for that reason, when segregation ended, it's going to take time to even things out, to get more black students, rise them up out of the segregated poverty that they were in so that they can get good educations and make good money. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's just a fact. That's just what it is. The African-American demographic is disadvantaged. On paper, we look at the statistics, we see that they're at a disadvantage. They're, they're starting way back there, and we're right here on the starting line, generally speaking. We're not talking as individuals, okay? I had a real shit life. I had a worse life than somebody like, say, Tyra Banks. A worse life. I had a lower chance of success than Tyra Banks. We're not talking about individuals. When you get down to the individual level, it gets absurd. We're talking about general demographic statistics. I, I assume that you guys are with me now. We've accepted that, that the African-American demographic is at a disadvantage and the white demographic, the Caucasian demographic, generally makes more money right out of college than the black demographic, right? Nobody's fault. Not blaming anybody here. 
but it's a problem that we need to fix. Now that we've acknowledged that it exists, that it's an actual issue, now we can address it. There's been debate about whether or not the wage gap between men and women exists, right? Originally, the claim was it was 70%. And then we realized that the wage gap was being calculated in a weird way and it didn't account for different jobs that women picked over men and things like that. So once you account for all that stuff, it brings the wage gap up to like 90%, 92%. Let's be super extra generous and just say it's 95% after you account for all of that stuff, okay? Nobody's fault. Not blaming men, not blaming women. But let's just say it's 95 cents to the dollar that women make. Most people can agree to meet me there. That's a disparity. How do we fix it? We want to fix that. We want it to be equal. I don't want it to be 95%. I want it to be 100%. And until it's equal, we're going to continue having this conversation. Until African Americans are equal on on paper and in practice, we're going to continue having the conversation. A literal Minecraft sheep, you need to look at the quiet revolution. Zulfner, the term white privilege is also racist. White privilege, it, 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 it exists. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It just exists. We can look on paper and see that the African-American demographic is at a disadvantage at the moment. Nobody's fault. Let's not place blame. We could place blame. We're not going to right now. For the sake of argument, let's just figure out how to fix it. That's all I care about. That's all I care about. Let's fix it. Anyway, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. I will talk to you guys next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues shoes, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.